Okay, it's two or three, so we're going to start this webinar. Uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us so far, and welcome to the uh, Performing Arts Relaunch Package webinar. My name is Ashley. Uh, I know it says Bronya. We're using a colleague's Zoom account today. Uh, I work in the Policy and Partnerships team here at CREATE, so I know I've spoken to many of you through our COVID update uh, emails. Before we begin, of course, my screen has frozen. We would just like to acknowledge the Aboriginal people across the state of New South Wales and their continued connections and practices to their lands, waters and cultures. We pay respects to elders past, present and future and the role Aboriginal artists play in keeping their cultures alive. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the Darawal land that I'm coming to you from today. Just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so uh, we will distribute the links to the recording uh, when they're available. And this is so anybody who missed out can watch and obviously anybody here can re-watch this as well. We ask that you keep your microphones on mute and your cameras off unless you're presenting. This just allows for better video quality for both the presenters and the recordings. Uh, please feel free to use the chat function, the chat box, to drop any questions in uh, throughout the presentation. We do have dedicated question time at the end of the presentation, so pop your questions in there and we'll go through them when we get there. Uh, your host for today's presentation uh, and webinar is Sue Proctor, Director at Create New South Wales, and so I'm going to hand over to Sue, and thank you. Thanks, Ashley, and uh, hi, um, everyone. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm on beautiful Gadigal land just down um, near Sydney Harbour and uh, am just enormously grateful of the uh, custodianship of, of um, First Nations people of this land for the past 60,000 years and uh, pay my, my deep respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, so welcome everyone to, um, this is the second webinar we've um, held today. There was a webinar this morning that we ran on um, Event Saver. A couple of you were um, uh, joined us for that meeting as well. Uh, that package is, is really designed for the very big end of town for, for major big events, you know, big festivals and things like that. This package um, and this webinar is focused very much on our uh, special performing arts uh, COVID support and relaunch package. Um, we, we're running this webinar because we've had a few inquiries from uh, the sector just to do a bit of a refresher course about what the uh, what the package is, uh, and primarily to open up for for questions. I know there's there's quite a lot of questions that have been coming through about um, how the package um, is is managed and how the funds are distributed. So I'm going to run through the, the basic principles of the of the package relatively quickly, um, just to give us some more time uh, ahead of the um, uh, for questions um, at the end so that we can kind of work through any of the issues or, or particular uh, questions that you might have. So um, Right, okay, so so the concept of this um, package is very much um, focused at the performing arts sector. So we're focusing on the performing arts sector with this uh, very uh, broad support or this large amount of money because um, that's the, the part of the arts and culture sector that has been most impacted financially as a result of the COVID um, shutdowns and um, capacity restrictions. Uh, we're not uh, taking away the enormous impact that COVID has had on the visual arts in any, in any way. It's uh, simply that on a financial level, because of the way the business models work in the performing arts, which is so heavily reliant on ticket sales, um, that financially um, the performing arts sector has, has um, shown itself to be one of the most vulnerable um, uh, sectors out of any industries um, in our um, economy. The other... Um, uh, impacted uh, or known impacted um, sectors include hospitality and tourism, but the performing arts take a particular space in, in the New South Wales government response because of the uh, time it takes to prepare work for the stage. It's not like a restaurant where you can just order the foods and switch the lights back on 
or tourism, just open up the, um, the, uh, the hotel um, doors again with performing arts. It takes, you know, many months, and, and I know you all know um, that, so I'm preaching to the converted. But that's why that the performing arts sector has, has continued to be supported so, um, I believe, generously by the New South Wales government over, over this um, period. The other factor is that um, the uh, performing arts uh, represents one of the best and safest ways to bring large, concentrated um, numbers of people back into the city centre um, in a COVID safe way. It, um, there's lots of research showing that the uh, broader economic impact of having people come in, maybe going to a bar and having a drink, maybe catching a taxi, maybe having their hair done, you know, th those kinds of things are having a, a very strong impact on the um, economic recovery. And one of the reasons that New South Wales is doing so well in rebounding from COVID is because that we've we've kept as, as much as possible, you guys supported so that you can immediately get shows back on the stage and, and tempt people back um, into the city. Um, that, that is the, the third reason that I, I guess we've been successful in arguing for the money is, is it also normalises sitting next to strangers. Again, going into a theatre and having somebody next to you um, is more tempting than, you know, maybe getting discounted bus tickets and things like that. So it's really about confidence building as well. So very broadly supported within government is, um, is is, is keeping the performing arts sector well well funded and well supported. So, um, and just in a nutshell, this, this package, this extension um, is an additional $80 million that we've been granted. So that um, over, since um, we went into lockdown on the 26th of June last year, that's a total of $205 million that we've been, that we have been and will be able to distribute to you guys to, to, keep, um, to keep you all functioning. So to be eligible for the program, first of all, you have to demonstrate that you're staging an eligible performance. So the, um, the definition of an eligible performance is, is um, either a theatrical or a musical performance, um, and it has to be of a, a reasonable um, duration um, in order to, to qualify. Um, it, it also includes um, comedy, it includes uh, circus, it includes you know or anything that we all know um, uh, is uh, an actual performance performance that's rehearsed and staged and presented to, um, to the public. So most of you will um, um, become eligible um, through that. Uh, some of the areas where um, we haven't been supporting the um, the applications for performances is motivational speakers we don't include. Uh, also, um, uh, Performances that are primarily being delivered for educational content or, or part of a uh, performance, an end of year performance for a dance school and those kinds of things. Um, we're, not, we're not including that as eligible performance, but pretty much we're pretty broad in, in what we let um, in as, as, um, as an eligible uh, performance. So next page, Ash. Um, the, the second one is about um, performing at an eligible venue. So there's a lot of focus on, on the venues because um, if, you, if you combine the performance and the venue together, you can actually uh, make sure that we don't get a situation where people are double dipping against um, the same performance. Um, as I'll go into later on, uh, we recognise that there's lots of uh, multiple partners involved in producing a single show. And by, by looking at the eligible performance, we're putting it a moment moment in time and then we're matching it with the eligible performance to make sure it's the performing arts that we're supporting. We've divided the, um, the type of eligible venues into different categories. Um, primarily uh, when we originally designed the package was to recognise that there's slightly different funding models that are sitting behind these different, um, different uh, venues. Um, with type A performance venues, they're the ones that are either independently run or run by the New South Wales government. So for example, the Opera House um, would be uh, a New South Wales government run venue. Uh, we, we pay that at a slightly higher percentage than the type B um, venues, which is local government and tertiary education provider and university owned venues. Uh, that's because we recognise that the, the local government or, or the, the education provider have um, resources themselves and should be able to um, contribute as well to help um, support the performances that are held in those venues. Um, type C is live uh, music venues, so they are um, the, the pubs um, and uh, other um, uh, other venues that 
that primarily operate for the delivery of live music. So this, this one is a, um, uh, can get a little contentious um, in relation to RSL clubs and, uh, and some of the, um, the uh, general clubs that are out um, in, in the New South Wales economy. Uh, we focus very much on um, uh, perform, uh, live music venues that have already been supported through the Destination New South Wales um, Great Southern Nights and uh, the live um, music support package that was uh, managed, administered by us last year, but under the, the banner of Destination New South Wales. And these, these live music venues are the ones that um, if they didn't exist, then live music wouldn't be able to, um, to continue. So we're looking at, at uh, venues like, like the Enmore. Um, my normal other example is the Lansdowne. Obviously, unfortunately, we've all seen the announcement that the Lansdowne um, will be closing as a live music venue, which is hugely unfortunate, but um, that is that decision, I think, as you all know, has been a between two commercial um, bodies that the landlord has decided that they want to use the space for the hostel accommodation rather than live music, not because the, the Lansdowne wasn't supported through this package. Um, we've then got uh, um, some major commercial uh, performance venues. So these are, um, you know, the Lyric Theatre, the Capital Theatre, um, the State and the Theatre Royal. So they're the kind of major musical lyric theatres that were running, um, you know, Hamilton and, and Come From Away and Go From the North Country and, and those kinds of um, performances. And the last one is a, is a new entry that we brought in with the late, um, recent, um, the, the last uh, revision, which, which does allow some of the really big um, stadiums and large venues into this package. We, we had been excluding them previously. Um, the only uh, additional limitation on those venues is that we only pay up to a maximum of 10,000 10,000 people. So if there's a um, Kudos Bank Arena, it might be, uh, I think it's 23 or 24,000 people it can hold, will only pay up to a maximum of 10,000. So they're still getting support, but they're not swamping the, the, the package um, with their sheer um, size. Now, um, we've got a list in the guidelines of all the performances that have gone through an eligi eligibility check. Um, there is the ca capacity for, for you guys to put in um, a application to have your venue um, considered for eligibility. Uh, it's a quite straightforward um, form. It's just part of the application process. So don't delay if you're not on the list, just, just apply and you'll see an area that ask, asks you a question about whether your um, your venue is, is on the eligibility list and it, if not, it'll then open up some additional information that we need. In order to be eligible, the types of things that we're looking at is, um, you know, that, that there are a formal ticketing system that's being run uh, by the venue, uh, that there is, the venue itself is, is marketing artists. Um, so um, if the venue um, traditionally runs a reggae night on Wednesday night, that probably isn't enough to substantiate being a critical live music venue. Um, we're really looking for evidence that the, the artists themselves are being, um, are being marketed and supported. Uh, DJs are, are um, we do take in electronic music and DJs as long as the, it's the DJ is being, um, being marketed and, and it's that act that is being, um, being supported. There are some, some very minor um, situations where we uh, um, grant eligibility status in what we regard as a, a pop-up environment. Um, that's to allow um, support of um, uh, things like circuses and things like that that might be um, performing on a, um, on, on a field for a short period of time. We don't, we're not um, um, supporting festivals. Festivals are generally supported through the event saver, the big end of town. Um, we will look at uh, festivals that are a brand name, but really um, are delivering multiple kind of one-off or, or, or or concert-like performances. So Sydney Fringe Festival, for example, has been supported under this package, but we wouldn't be doing something that, that has the flavour um, of, a, of a festival. And we've got a definition in the guidelines at the moment um, that we're... Um, that we'll probably do a, a small revision to, but it's basically that it's under a banner, um, marketed as a single um, entity. It goes for more than five hours and that there's more than five performances on the list and there's normally headline acts. So th those kinds of things tend to um, not be uh, successful through the proje project, but there is a grey line. So always put your um, application in and have a talk to the team um, to see if we can um, get you supported. 
Um, so uh, how you apply, there is a, um, there's a link um, on the Create New South Wales website that'll just take you straight into Smarty Grants. And uh, we've really tried to make the application form as simple as possible. We know how incredibly busy you all are. And, you know, particularly with COVID, just the workload, the administrative workload has just been um, unbelievable. We're very sympathetic to, to that situation. So really it's, it's just giving us enough information that we can have a look at your website or look at um, uh, uh, look at the the ticketing kind of information that you're um, collecting, and then there is a, an Excel spreadsheet that you just put in all um, all of the individual performances that you want to claim under the package, and give us some information around uh, the average ticket price and the venue capacity in in that in that um, in that form. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, so, um, so basically, if you if you've got an eligible performance at an eligible event that um, was staged or was scheduled to be staged anywhere between the twenty sixth of June and now out to thirtieth of April, there's there's a good chance that you'll be eligible for funding under this package. The one thing that that we're requiring, and I know that there'll be some questions about this at the end of the um, end of the uh, presentation, is that only one. Only one person or one group, um, one in, um, company can make an application for each eligible performance. The, the reason that we do that is, is we know that there are multiple um, uh, potential people who might have a claim on a, um, on a performance. It could be the venue, it could be the promoter, it could be the producer, it could be the artists themselves. Uh, we know that all, everyone could have a claim on some of that funding. What we can't do is, um, is adjudicate and manage how the funding gets split between those what we call related parties. So what what you what you need to do is um, between yourselves you have to decide who is the primary applicant, the person who's going to put in the application on behalf of all the related parties, and you have to reach agreement before you submit your application on how the money's going to be split. So it really is a case of having just to sit down with the people um, who who you've negotiated with before because you were when you originally agreed to do the performance together you had to negotiate on how how um, the box office was going to be split or or how um, fees were going to be paid you just need to sit down and and you need to, to to reach an agreement on what is a fair and equitable split amongst yourselves to to do that we can give um, a degree of um, guidance and as I said we'll, we'll um, I'll talk to some of the issues that have been coming up um, recently at the end of the um, presentation but we're not going to get involved in your individual kind of commercial arrangements. We don't have the resources and it's also not the right space for government to be um, stepping in. So ultimately, um, it will be up to each of you to negotiate. The sting in the tail is unless you can get agreement, um, we won't pay you. So you, you've, got to, you've got to reach agreement. You've got to all say, yep, this is, this is the way it's going to be. And then the primary applicant needs to sign a statutory declaration to say that that agreement has been reached. So, um, Next page. So basically, uh, what we've been doing is we've been flexing between high and low rates um, on how we how we make payments. Um, we've, and again, we've tried to make the um, the calculation as simple as possible so that you guys can actually work out for yourself. So when you're doing the negotiation with related parties, everyone is going to be able to calculate how much we will be paying because it's it's quite simple um, calculation. We look at the venue capacity. Um, and in most cases, that's, that's publicised by the venues themselves. There may be some reduction in, in the venue capacity if some of the seats have been taken off, uh, off um, sale because of the size of the venue, uh, size, size of the stage and things like that. But essentially, the venue capacity is pretty, pretty known and pretty set. Um, we then times that by the average ticket price. So um, in some cases, we've had people putting in claims that include um, maybe a free drink or a, a dinner and a show, we'd be making them strip out the um, the the uh, value of, of those non-performance items, um, and it should be exclusive of GST. We've had some issues around getting um, getting the GST out of the average ticket price. But once you've got kind of to that raw average ticket price, you've got the venue capacity, you just times those two together and times um, by the eligible percentage against your venue and against the period at which your um, performance has taken place. So when we, um, when we were, um, when, we extended the um, 
support package to this relaunch package, we had um, the, the percentage at the highest rate. So until the 31st of October, all the venues were getting kind of the maximum um, support available to them. From the 1st of November and now to the 16th of December, originally um, until we did this current extension, it was going to the 31st of December and then the support was stopping. Now that we've extended it, we've taken it from the 1st of November to the 16th of December, you're at the lower rate because confidence was rebuilding. Omicron hadn't really hit. Um, we've picked the 17th of uh, December to be the day when um, the, the flip happened as far as confidence and the additional support that's needed um, in line with the first venue that was locked down, which was the Argyle in, in in Newcastle as a result of the Omicron spread. So from the 17th of December through now to, to the 14th of March, we're going to pay you at the higher rate to give you that support that you need while confidence is rebuilding and to um, and also to, to recognising that there are costs um, associated with um, ensuring that you adhere to your COVID safe management plan. And all things going well, um, assuming that, uh, you know, the, the surge of Omicron um, does begin to peak and, um, and that things seem to be moving back in the direction to where they were back in November, we'll be dropping down to that lower rate between the 15th of March to the 30th of, of April. And again, that, that funding, um, you can get that even if you sell out at 100%, you're still going to get that funding. Um, and um, the reason that we're doing that is, um, number one, to build your confidence to keep, to know that you'll have a steady income stream in relation to box office, but also to ensure that you've got some, some money while you, your business model adjusts to having to do rapid antigen testing and, and um, uh, looking at maybe understudies and things like that to, to keep the show um, going forward. So, um, so the question is, um, do you have to perform to receive funding? It, it, the, the basic principle is yes. This is a package that's incentivising you to get the shows out there and make sure that there's a great, vibrant offering to tempt people out of their homes and, and, and back into the centre and engaging with the economy. Um, and that's been the case ever since um, the package started. It just was in the first stages of the of the package from the 26th of um, June to the 31st of October. There was a blanket lockdown order, a public health order that meant that you couldn't perform. So the principle is that the public there has to be a public health order in place that's stopping you from performing for you to still be eligible for funding. If there's no public health order in place, then you need to perform. Um, so at the moment, there's nothing in place that is actually stopping you from per, um, performing about, oh, can I just um, get you to drop back to the, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, there's nothing that's stopping you to, um, to perform. There is, um, we have, we are going to be including the capacity for type C venues, which are live music venues to um, potentially come to us and talk about being irrevocably compromised. Now, this is a term that's come out of the event saver package um, to deal with the public health order about singing and dancing. Um, we recognise that there may be some situations with some of the live music venues that it's just not possible for them to proceed because they won't be able to control their audiences to, to remain seated and, and not, um, not sing and dance. So um, there is um, uh, the capacity for, for us to consider them being irrevocably compromised and therefore are able not to perform but still get the money. And to be really clear, um, um, cast getting sick, um, uh, cast or crew getting sick and, or loss of ticket sales, you know, lack of con um, consumer confidence aren't reasons to cancel and still be eligible for funding under this package. Uh, you may have to do that or you may choose to do that because you, you, you're just not getting the box office, but um, we won't be paying that um, out of this funding if you've made that business decision to, um, to, to do that. Okay, so I think um, that's, I kind of whizzed through the, the basic um, uh, uh, flavour, the basic framework of the package. Um, so we, I got a couple of questions on notice before um, the, uh, 
the presentation today. So I think I will just quickly whiz through those and just make sure that we've covered those off. So I had a, um, a question from Marianne at um, Arts Out West about getting your venue on the eligible, um, being an eligible venue. So I think um, we've answered that and there was a bit of a time, um, what, what is the time frame about um, the approval process? We try and do things as quickly as possible. We're not moving as fast as we want at the moment. We're, we're pretty um, tightly resourced team, um, but generally, um, if once you put the application in, um, it goes through uh, two assessments by um, one member, each member, you know, different members of the team, and then I do the final um, approval. I tend to go, um, to run through the the venues that are um, up for um, consideration um, on the weekend, so maybe once a week we, we we flush out those ones that are coming through. So it probably would take about two weeks from the time that you apply to the time that we'd be able to confirm whether it's um, eligible or not. Would be a reasonable um, rule of thumb. I might just get uh, Michael. Are you on the line? There he is. Two weeks. <laughs> so everybody knows and loves Michael. Um, and Two weeks. Uh, my my partner in crime at trying to keep the wheels on this uh, very large and wobbly bus. Um, is that about right, Michael? About two weeks, do you think? I think three is probably more realistic. I think the other thing is that for performances from um, one November on, have have the double step application. So the the eligibility is checked first, and then we ask you to confirm that the performance has actually happened by adding a certified box office certificate, which for those who aren't aware what it is, that's a um, printout from your box office that someone in authority has signed, be that the box office manager, be that you as the applicant, but someone who's actually saying, this is a true and accurate record. And then we confirm the average ticket price off the real numbers. And so that, that can actually add an extra week Take oh, a little bit more time. Yes, yeah, certainly the, the the process from when you put your application into when you're going to be notified what you're going to get paid um, is longer than that because we also have the uh, cross checking of the related parties, which can uh, it really depends on how much information you've provided in the original application. Um, the teams often got to go back and get um, additional information. So the more um, you can provide up front, the quicker we can move through it. But as far as confirmation of just a venue eligibility. Um, as part of that application process. We, we try and push those through. So at least you've got visibility that, that you're okay, you're in the running, but the actual um, final approval, there's, as Michael said, because the package um, now requires proof that you, um, you have performed because there's no public health order to support why you wouldn't have performed. You've actually, we've got to wait until the performance has happened before we can verify it. So, so that's why the ones, um, as Michael said, from November through, um, through to December, and it will continue we'll, we'll need to um, we'll need to get through the performance period before we can process and pay you um, if there's um, and this we won't do this um, broadly but if you've got serious cash flow issues talk to us so that we can we can try and accommodate that but generally speaking it, it's taking a few months to go from from application to getting um, the money uh, across to you just because of the various checks and balances we've got a couple of complications in the package that we've got across check with Service New South Wales about whether um, you guys have applied for the um, business support package and then we've got to net off the money um, to, to calculate that. And those kind of cross-government check, cross-checkings can take a little bit more than time than what we would hope. But, you know, the, the intention is to get it through as, as quickly as possible, is trying to reduce the administration on your side um, as much as possible. Um, and then it's just a case of us trying to push it through as quickly as possible. So it's, you know, we're, we um it's a it's a challenge but uh you know we're, we're working as hard as we can to to achieve that um, I then had a question. Um, I've had a kind of a few questions around um, the uh, the venue and the um, producer or the um, organising parties split and how how that money should be um, allocated. As I said in the presentation, we're not going to dictate um, what the commercial arrangement should be, but the general principle is that um, if um, if for example uh, an organisation is receiving receiving a performance fee in order to um, uh, provide the venue with the, um, with the performance, and that fee's been paid, 
The only consideration that I think you, that the venues need to take um, on board is that the, the production company will have had to incur additional costs in order to deliver it in a COVID safe way. So there'll be um, rapid antigen testing costs, possibly understudies, possibly um, travel costs, things like that. That um, I think that there should be an open conversation between the, um, the producers of the work and the venue that's um, delivering or showcasing the work to make sure that if, if there is um, extensive out-of-pocket um, um, costs that are being incurred um, by the producer, if they've already received a fee, then you might just want to have a bit of a discussion to see if there's um, an allocation that, that would be fair and equitable. We're, we're really, really keen uh, for you guys to kind of work together. I mean, we're all trying to keep the fabric of the, of, of the sector um, as um, robust as we possibly can. And it's in no one's interest to kind of take more than what they should have under these circumstances at the expense of another organisation, because that's only going to make us as a sector weaker overall. So it's really looking at the spirit of the agreement that was in place that you negotiated, you know, when you were actually deciding to put the show on, making sure that, that the amount that is being received has either been met under the contract or that the split of the money, which is transparently available for you guys to calculate, is being um, is being distributed in a fair and equitable way. So hopefully, um, hopefully that clarifies. But really, really happy to to take more specific questions on that and and maybe help you guys um, work your way through that um, that part of it. So, um, so that what really, I think that was the, um, oh, the, there's a question here about whether the applicant has to somehow prove the impact of COVID, what, what um, um, has had on the, the performance, whether the, um, the uh, number of people have turned up um, have, have reduced. Um, no, um, so that's, that kind of goes back to that, um, that concept of we look at total venue capacity, total average um, ticket price, and then we pay the percentage. Whether you get 100% um, you, you sell out or whether you've only got 10 people turning up doesn't actually make any difference on the calculation. We purposely done it that way because it is verifiable and objective about what those numbers are. As soon as you get into the world of thinking, well, we should have had 400, but we only got 300 because people didn't want to come. That becomes a really difficult thing for us to judge and administer. So we've we've set the percentage rate working on on total um, uh, uh, venue capacity. Um, uh, there's another question here, uh, is, is eligible shows are newly booked or shows that have been, uh, is it only eligible if it's been booked before or is it just um, uh, new shows? Uh, it's any performance that is at that point of time. We, we, um, we're not uh, fussed about whether it's been postponed or newly created um, in, um, as this package moves forward. We just want performances on, on, on the stage. So um, if your performance is cancelled due to um, or postponed due to a public health order, you'll receive um, payment for non-performance then. Um, and then if you reschedule it in this current period, you'll, you'll receive payment again for that. But you won't, if you postpone it today, you won't get funding for that because there's no public health order to, to, um, to support that application under that fund. I hope that makes sense. Um, I think, jump in if I haven't answered any other, uh, um, other advanced questions, but um, what have we got coming through the chat line, Ash? Quite a few, so I'll just scroll back up and go through them for you. Uh, so Pauline asked right at the beginning, so some of these may have been actually answered by the presentation. Uh, do we submit all shows with con contact info, average ticket price, dates, et cetera, all the way to 30th of April, even though they haven't taken place yet? Or do we just add in the ones that have been staged and passed up to the deadline date of 14th of February? Look, my, my preference is to give us as much information as possible. So I'm using all of your advanced schedules to be pressure testing how much money I need um, and how much and whether we've got enough funding. Um, so it, it is really, really helpful for me to get the full picture um, if you can. So my, that's my definite um, preference. 
um, is to is to give us as much um, forward looking. Uh, it's it's helpful for me. Um, so one of the reasons I was able to quickly uh, move from the 31st of December to the 14th of February over that Christmas break when we lost the minister and um, I was on leave and all of those kind of things. We were able to make those changes because I had access to the data and was able to justify it. Same with um, getting the extra 80 million to go out to the 30th of April. So the more um, detailed information I've got, um, you know, just in case, God forbid, we have another um, variant come up and we're in another situation, I would like to be able to, to argue for the need and, and give them a very clear picture of what of, of, of what risk is, is out there over those dates. So as much information as possible would be preferred. Great. Uh, do we use the scheduled performance Excel doc that we submitted for the first COVID support package and just add on these new shows? Or do we start one fresh with the shows that were not submitted in a previous application? I'll let you, I can't get my head around that one. And Michael has it in spades. So Michael, over to you on that one. Thanks, Sue. Uh, okay, so Basically, it's a new, do a new application. I was just sending an additional uh, message to Pauline there about that. We're also suggesting that just to speed up because any performances that need that double, double check on them, uh, suggesting you do that in a one month or a two month batch, whichever one works better for you, so that we can then, you, you know, it means that you're not waiting till April for payments that happened in January. So if you say, put your schedule in for Jan Feb, and then another application that is in for March, April, then that will move through the pipeline quicker. Um, but to go back to there, uh, for those who are still using the old schedule, please don't. There is a new schedule attached to the application um, that has some Pretty other awesome. magic, <laughs> magic happenings behind it um, that of course we have to redo if you use the old schedule. Um, so just download the new schedule as you start a new application. Um, you feel free to cut and paste from your old schedule that you've got. A lot of the columns are pretty much the same. That um, so I'm just wondering if it's no, it doesn't matter. I was about to say the the cancelled um, cancelled rescheduled definitions might be worth just quickly running through as well for anyone who's got performances back in September and October that they may not have submitted yet. Uh... So original original is the original. I'll do it. <laughs> original is the original <laughs> date. That, that it was submitted. If it's a postponed date, as in this event will be postponed, we don't know when it's going to happen, or this event is cancelled. And if it's rescheduled, is this is the rescheduled date. Yeah. But the general principle, I, I think, is that it's okay to postpone and cancel under public health order. But if you postpone and cancel outside of public health order, there's no money. So, um, but and we we're um, happy to to pay if you if there was a performance um, for argument's sake in July that then got postponed to September that then got postponed to December, uh, we would pay on the July one, the September one. But um, if it didn't go ahead in December, we wouldn't pay out on that one. So it's just whether there's a public health order that, that allows you to keep on postponing it. Great. Uh, question from Amy, uh, and this one also has a follow-up message as well. There is an issue with schools and lack of confidence and often school bans uh, on excursion, sorry, school bans on excursions and uh, excursions during term one. If we have work for children young or young people that relies on school bookings, is there an argument to extend that higher percentage to the end of the school term? And the follow-up from Amy, just to clarify, is that the ban on excursions um, is a direct effect of the Omicron outbreak and schools work in terms, um, so it's a blanket ban to be reviewed in term two. So there's no government directive on this, but principals are making their own decisions. So I get, uh, j just so I'm sure that I understand the question, because obviously we're not supporting any educational, um, um, so if, if it's a school performance, we're not um, going to be supporting that. I can see that you're from Riverside, I think, Amy. So I'm guessing that what you're saying is that you would have performances that would traditionally be attended by school children 
and that because of the ban that is going on um, around excursions, um, you're having a drop in in the number of performances that you can push through. Um, I think that the short answer, unfortunately, is is no, we're not going to be able to extend the package to kind of deal with that particular circumstance. Um, the reason is that um, it's the, um, we're looking at the public health orders and we're looking at um, what the public health orders allow as far as performances are concerned. Um, that's, this is a, that's an additional, um, a different mechanism, a different administrative order, presumably that, that's causing that. So I can't see the connection between the two. Um, it's, it's lack of confidence. Confidence. It's lack of. It's all those things that we're not really supporting under the package. Um, that's my gut. I'm very happy to take that one and and talk um, in more detail um, with you, Amy, offline, just to make sure that I've understood the problem uh, correctly. But certainly, at um, I, I would say that no, there isn't. There, that we won't be able to support ones now um, until the end of end of first term, but but let's take that one offline for some additional com, um, conversation, just so I'm sure I'm I'm giving the right advice. Great, thanks Sue. Uh, Cindy would like to know, if possible, uh, how much would venues normally take? Will the venue just get the portion of box office charge? Uh, totally dependent on the um, uh, commercial arrangements, um, and it's really different from venue to venue and performance type to performance type. So um, a live music venue, for example, um, won't rely on box office um, for their income stream. They rely on, you know, uh, bar sales or food and bev or, or merchandise or, or whatever um, and so uh, there has definitely been arguments across the live music um, venues that they should receive a, a reasonable proportion of the um, the payment that's been calculated on on box office it was actually that argument that um, caused us to change the percentage on uh, type c on the second iter iteration of the guidelines to recognize that there are different arrangements and different commercial relate um, arrangements that go on with each of these venues. So there's no rule of thumb, uh, unfortunately. Um, it really um, requires a, a kind of a sitting down and looking at, well, how, what would the venue have been receiving if the doors had been open and if, if there's um, alternative revenue streams that they might have been accessing, then that should be taken into consideration in the negotiations of the, um, of the, the flow on of the money. Uh, so Bree has prefaced this by saying, I don't know if you'll be able to give an answer to this. Oh, but given, <laughs> given illness is not covered under this funding, she's just wondering what kind of support is out there for immunocompromised performers and other performers who are at high risk? Uh, thinking of instances where they booked a show four months in advance and then the COVID situation changed where performers performances can still legally go ahead, but they no longer feel comfortable or safe performing by that date. Yeah, look, and and this may well be a question uh, for Ash more than um, more than me. And I know that um, Beck Dean and, and Ash have been doing an amazing job about working through a lot of these complexities around the health orders and around uh, what happens in in these situations. As far as this package is concerned, there's there there isn't any capacity for us to. Uh, um, take that into account um, at the moment. There's uh, really um, the, the, the performances and the venues need to have their COVID safe management plan. They need to be looking at um, what um, is reasonable. It's a question around, um, you know, the WHS laws and providing a safe workplace for, for the um, for the actors and the crew as well as the audience. So it's kind of a, a broader issue. So. Uh, I think um, there isn't really the capacity. Uh, it, it's not part of this this kind of world. Ash, is there anything that you want to add to that um, at this point, or uh, it's something that comes up a lot in our just our regular COVID inquiries that we get, and unfortunately, there's nothing from New South Wales Health to really address it, except that they acknowledge that it is an issue. But there's it's something that the PHO always has to be very broad, and so. It, it's a part of that minutia that the PHO usually doesn't address. Yeah. But if you wanted, I, I'll put my email address in the chat box at the end um, for COVID inquiries. I don't um, deal with the, the packages, but 
we can try and get in touch with other organisations who have staff who are compromised and we can put you in touch and just see what they're doing. I know it's a lot of rat testing and but there might be some strategies that can be shared. Uh, so the question from Lee, given the small business grant was in 2021 and our financial year is by calendar year, are we eligible for assistance for 2022 performances or will the small business grant rule still apply? Good question. Thinking on my feet, but we'll check um, against um, Treasury and Michael, you can jump into it, is, is really we just net off um, uh, once to the maximum 15,000. So if, for example, under this package, you were entitled to 17,000 and you've already received the full 15,000, we'll just keep netting off um, until you get that final 2,000. Is that right, Michael? Is that how we're doing it? Yeah, so basically depending, because there's three levels you can receive, could, could have received support from the New South Wales government through the COVID support business grant, seven and a half, 10 and a half and 15K. So that amount is held and tracked. So every time you are entitled to money, if you receive the 15,000, as Sue just said, that gets chipped away. And then once you've exceeded the $15,000, you then receive the additional funds. It's one of the joys of my life. <laughs> Yeah, we weren't planning that one when we designed the spreadsheet, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so question from Andrew. It is a condition of the package that all parties have agreed prior to lodgement. If one party becomes aware that another has lodged without agreement, uh, which of course means their stat deck is untrue, how do they proceed? Do they report this to Create New South Wales? A short question, yes, disappointing if that's happened. We have had, uh, particularly early on in the piece, we did get um, a, a lot of people just applying and the amazing um, team that Michael leads, um, you know, Tara and Sean and Megan um, and Michael are, are incredibly um, careful in checking that those things have actually happened so yeah report it um let us know and and we'll follow up and 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 talk to the applicant we've had had to have applications withdrawn we've had to have um things re recalculated and 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 those kinds of things so um yeah just let us know but also contact the applicant to try and sort that through a clarification is requested the average ticket price. Is that an average or are all ticket sales added up and divided by the number of tickets sold? So the, uh, yeah, so the average is um, ultimately, now that we're performing, um, is going to be taken from the box office uh, report. So uh, um, if I don't get give this one clearly enough, I'll get Michael to jump in and, and help. But essentially it is adding up all the, um, all the tickets that are sold, uh, no, sorry, all the tickets on sale and then divided by the capacity. So, um, and then we would look at that average ticket price after the performance has happened and just verify that the, um, that, 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 the, that was in fact the average ticket price. So um, Michael, can you explain that better than me? <laughs> sure, average, average ticket price is gross income, less GST if it's applicable, less credit card charges. And you divide that by the number of paying people. So if, for example, your box office income was 5,000 people and you had 100 people who paid, then your average ticket price is $50, assuming there's no GST. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, but, but we, we take the calculation in the first instance if when there was a public health order based on what the tickets on, on sale were and do that across the full venue capacity. And then when the if a performance has actually gone ahead, we then verify what has actually been sold. And as Michael said, we take the, the gross earnings, less GST, less credit card charges and divide it by the number of people who attend. Paid, paid attendees. Sorry, paid, that's right. Another one from Rich, if an act cancels the performance and the period is outside the public health order, can an application be accepted if you could not dance or sing to an act? Uh, well, the, the, there's a couple of things there, I, I think. So if, if the act cancels, um, uh, the question would be, 
why like the the irrevocably compromised thing is is going to be a tricky one to to get through so i think we'll need to um uh, and i'm assuming that that you're a type c venue so it's really something that we're only going to be looking at with type c and it's really in response to there was uh, quite a large number of venues that shut um in january in response to the singing and dancing so we'd would have to kind of unpack it a little bit about um i mean i had an example from one of the venues where uh they said that they cancelled because the act um very similar question to what Bree had before the the um the act was um nervous about performing and didn't didn't want to perform um so um in it, because they didn't want to catch COVID, we, we won't pay on that level. But um, if there was a kind of a across the um, across the board decision that the singing and dancing had um, irre irrevocably compromised the type of performances that are being delivered, we, we will work through that. So it's, um, yeah, uh, so I'm just looking at the chat now. If a show is irrevocable and is cancelled because no singing or dancing, how do you work out the average ticket price? We go back to what was originally on sale um, and what the ticket price was was um, as far as. So in most cases with a type C venue, it's just a single 20 bucks to get through the door kind of thing. Um, it, when you've got performances in big theatres where you've got A reserve and B reserve and C reserve, we, we take an average of all of those different um, price points um, according to the, the capacity. So we, if, the, if the event doesn't go ahead, we go what was advertised. If it does go ahead, then we do a cross check of what the final average price was. Okay. Uh, Cindy would like to know, will this package cover New South Wales based orchestras performing in interstate? No, unfortunately not. Um, the because uh, the reason why is that um, the focus of the package is to create the performance event, and so the performance of it's, it becomes the venue and where the venue is located that is critical. So theoretically, a Victorian orchestra performing in a New South Wales venue would be supported, but a New South Wales um, organisation performing in Victoria wouldn't under this package. Right. Uh, just there was a comment from Rich in addition to the past question that there's multiple prices in type C venues if early bird prices. Yeah. So we would, um, under the, uh, Michael, under those circumstances, I mean, if it was cancelled, we would then just look at um, look at how many tickets had been sold through the early bird and 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 what had been, but what had been sold. We do come to what is a reasonable um base at the end of the day we we're not um uh, we're not going to be trying to screw the average ticket down price down as low as possible uh, we're going to be looking at what is what is the reasonable position that when as a business it, it was decided to go ahead with that performance there's an idea in in everyone's head about about what they'd get in the box office so we'd be looking at that reasonable price so i would yeah, just just work with the team. We, we, we'll work through that and and um, get get to a point that's defensible. Um, another one from Lee. We had a show cancelled late June due to the public health lockdown that we did not make a claim for because we had received the fifteen thousand dollars small business grant. However, given the advice just before that the amounts are tracked, it would seem we should have applied. Is it now too late to do so? No, throw it in, Lee. No problem. Uh, from Margaret, further to Amy's question about shows put on during the day for schools, what if no schools book in due to ban the ban on excursions? Uh, surely the performance won't proceed to an empty theatre and therefore becomes ineligible for funding. Could this be taken into consideration? Uh, look, we we'll certainly can have a, a think about it, but I think um, one of the, I guess, one of the hard things about the stimulus packages generally is they're a bit of a blunt instrument. They're, they're kind of designed in order to um, bring in as much uh, support as possible, as broadly as possible, but then you get to edges of, of what is in and what is out, and that's what um, where the guidelines kind of become the, um, the critical tool of, of what we will let in and what we won't um, let in. 
So I think that um, under those circumstances, um, I've got a meeting with Treasury later on this afternoon. I'll raise it and, and just kind of test the waters. Um, stay in contact with us and we'll, we'll talk it through. I understand what the issue is. I just think that um, we may not have the mechanism to actually um, um, help in that in that um, particular situation. But that's not a definite no, it just is. I can't immediately see the pathway through. And I've just put the uh, sector.support email address up on the screen for everybody. So, And just ignore the event saver name at the top. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. We were. Uh, I, I changed PowerPoint's the email address. <laughs> very quickly. Ash has done an amazing job. So thank you. All right. Any, any other questions? No, I can't see any questions that we've missed. Excellent. I think that's it. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I really appreciate um, you coming along. And uh, you yeah, don't hesitate to, to contact us if there's um, anything we can do to help. So um, thank you. Thank you, everyone.